Welcome to the Well Woman Show, where we interview women executives, leaders, and entrepreneurs. And you're listening to the Well Woman Show, where motivated women achieve fulfillment and well being. You're listening to the Well Woman Show. Take time for myself by coming to things like Well Woman Drinks, to be accepting of myself no matter what. Step away from judgment as much as possible. You're listening to The Well Women Show. Just, you're going to be in for a good ride. I don't regret anything. Everything I've ever done, I've learned from it, one way or another, good or bad. Being a little bit selfish for yourself, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first and then give what's left. I'm a woman. I would prefer to, to tell my own story. My story, though it's very personal, is universal. You're listening to The Well Woman Show. And now your host, Giovanna Rossi. Hi, Giovanna Rossi here, and welcome to another episode of The Well Woman Show, where I interview women leaders, executives, and entrepreneurs about their lives and their road to becoming and being who they are today. Are you at the top of your game professionally, but feeling burned out, or finding it hard to focus on your goals, or unfulfilled personally? Or are you in transition, simply juggling so many things, you find it hard to take care of your own needs? Well, you're not alone. We all need to activate the four universal superpowers. These are the internal strengths and abilities we all already have, but don't use all the time. Superpowers can be cultivated and they include awareness, intuition, action, and acceptance. Toward the end of the show in a segment called superpowers for success, I ask my guest about her superpowers and the answers will give you the strength, perspective, and power to live a well woman life. I'm so happy you're here. So thanks for tuning in. This episode of The Well Woman Show is brought to you by Collective Action Strategies, supporting organizations that support women and families, and by Well Woman Life Movement Challenge Quiz, your resource for living your best life. If you're in burnout or major transition, this is your time to figure out what's holding you back from making the changes you need to make in order to live your fullest, most joyful life. The cause of all of our challenges, personal or professional, can actually be rooted in the lack of internal superpowers and or external supports. Our Well Woman Life Framework tells you which stage of the Well Woman Life Cycle you're in and what to do about it so you can truly live your best life. You can find out more at wellwomanlife.com slash quiz. I'm so thankful for support from Natural Awakenings Magazine in New Mexico, a monthly green healthy lifestyle publication. And for support from High Desert Yoga, promoting optimum physical health, clarity of mind, and spiritual inspiration for all. Before we get started, I want to let you know that the Well Woman Superpower Retreat is September 9th this year, and it's your chance to dive deep into the Well Woman Life framework, figure out your superpowers, and start living your best life. Also, I'm very excited to announce the Albuquerque Business First and Well Woman Life Women's Leadership Summit on September 10th, so you can make it a two-day experience. Visit wellwomanlife.com slash events for more information. Today's topic is disrupting to innovate. We disrupt the narrative that you have to hustle, compete, and succumb to hate in order to get ahead as a woman, as a nurturer, as a leader, or as a business owner, in order to create what we know to be true, that we can lead with self-care, collaboration, and love as our focus to achieve our goals and live the life we desire. I'll walk you through the four stages of the Well Woman Life Cycle as we disrupt in order to innovate. Then I'll talk to an incredible group of women who are disrupting current systems and norms around breastfeeding and pumping in order to innovate in research and tech, change public and private policy, and shift social norms. First, a quick overview of the Well Woman Life Cycle. For high-achieving women, it's hard to sit by and watch our lives unfold in ways that don't live up to the expectations we have for ourselves, whether it's relationships, our health, our financial success, or our career. We know that there's so much more we can contribute to the world, and we're ready to step up, meet the challenge, and be rewarded for investing in ourselves and for serving others. But there are challenges. We are hard workers, yet we tend to overdo it. We're determined and strong, and we sometimes don't know when to slow down or how to. We're focused and driven and realize we need to course correct in major areas of our lives, which can lead to huge shifts that can be difficult to manage. 
The self-help world relies on individual behavior change. You work on yourself first in order to change the world. It says we have to hustle. We have to compete. We have to succumb to the many forms of hate in order to get ahead as a woman, as a nurturer, as a leader, or as a business owner. I believe we have to disrupt this narrative in order to create what we know to be true, that we can lead with self-care, with collaboration, and with the many forms of love in order to achieve our goals and live the life we desire. I propose that real change is determined by the interaction of two factors, not one. The two factors are individual change. Yes, we do need that. And the second factor is environmental or external change. And the interaction of these two factors determines which stage of the well woman life cycle we're in. So if you think to yourself, uh, think of a challenge that you're having in your personal or your professional life and think about your, um, internal super fa- superpowers and then think about the external factors that impact that challenge. And depending on where you are with those two uh, factors, you are in one of four stages of the well woman life cycle, which is receptive, meaning this is the open a stage of flow and love. We're not pushing, pushing. We're not hunting. We're not at war with life. We're in flow. The second stage is responsive. That's where we're quick to react to external stimuli. We're not going inside uh, to listen. We are um, usually in burnout or extremely exhausted, um, maybe having a health breakdown or some other kind of breakdown. Um, the third stage is passive, and that is going inside, contracting, just being or lingering with what is. And the fourth stage is active. That's a stage of change, of transition, of using your intuition and experience to give you the wisdom to take action. Uh, it's a time for expansion and This is where we really uh, call upon all of the tools and practices that we've been using in order to really take that next step, take a leap or take action. Now, I want to point out that many high achieving women um, want to go straight to action, right? We go into burnout and then we want to go straight to action, but it's really important to slow down and listen to what's going on inside and go through that other stage, which is the passive stage. And when I mean, when I say passive, it doesn't mean that you're not doing anything. It's hard work for sure. Um, but it's, it's not an active, active stage where you're, you know, making big decisions, making big changes in your life. When we skip this stage, we tend to get back into burnout very quickly. Um, because we haven't taken the time. If you want to find out which stage you're in, go to wellwomanlife.com slash quiz to learn more. And we'll be going deep into this at the retreat on September 9th. So definitely check out wellwomanlife.com slash events for more information. And you can find all the links and uh, more information about this show at wellwomanlife.com slash 128 show. In the United States, only 22% of babies are exclusively breastfed for the recommended six months. New parents face challenges, including stigma, lack of access to education and resources related to breastfeeding and pumping, unfriendly employer policies, unforeseen costs, and racial bias in the healthcare system, according to the website of Make the Breast Pump Not Suck Breastfeeding Festival. The first Make the Breast Pump Not Suck hackathon in 2014 focused on the technological and physical difficulties of pumping because the basic technology and structure of the standard breast pump hasn't changed much since its creation in the 1850s. This year's breastfeeding festival included over 175 engineers, advocates, healthcare experts, parents, and students to address the many challenges of breastfeeding and pumping. 
I caught up with some of the Make the Breast Pump Not Suck Breastfeeding Festival team at the recent U.S. Breastfeeding Committee Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. I talked with Binta Beard, the Policy Lead Summit, Catherine Dignazio, the Executive Director, Rachel Lorenzo, the Community Innovation Team Leader, Becky Michelson, the Program Manager, and Jen Roberts, the Equity and Inclusion Lead. You can read their full bios at wellwomanlife.com slash 128 show. I'm sitting with the organizers of the Make the Breast Pump Not Suck Breastfeeding Festival. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank Thank you. We're all huddled together because we're on one mic. Um, But I wanted to ask you, um, I've got Jen, Binsa, Catherine, Becky, and Rachel here. And um, I just wanted to ask you, what are you, what are you working on? What, what is the Breastfeeding Festival and how does it impact women's lives and well-being? Uh, so maybe I'll start. This is Catherine. Um, the Breastfeeding Festival comprised a number of different spaces. Uh, this was an event that took place at the MIT Media Lab in April 2018. Um, and it's most well known for comprising a hackathon, which is a, a intense 48-hour design sprint where people make things. And in this case, we were making breastfeeding innovations. Um, but this time around, we also had a policy summit to make family leave policy not suck. And and we also tried to create a really incredible atmosphere that was creative and inclusive and welcoming. So we also had an art exhibition of amazing, beautiful breastfeeding art. We had a product expo of entrepreneurs who are doing amazing work and innovating uh, for supporting breastfeeding. And we even had like a nap room and a baby village where parents could get massages and infants could get massages. So that's why we call it uh, in all a breastfeeding festival. But uh, the main point of the whole event was was to develop creative, inclusive solutions um, for breastfeeding access and uh, continuity. Okay. And Rachel, you're the community uh, innovation team leader. What kinds of things did you contribute? Um, I brought a team together from Laguna um, to make our traditional Pueblo regalia more breastfeeding friendly. So we hacked the design as it's made now, and we made four different prototypes um, back in New Mexico. And then when we went to the hackathon um, in April, we rehacked uh, one of the prototypes to make it even better. And so we took those designs back home and have been displaying them for our communities throughout the state and helping other Native people envision how they might um, make something uh, more breastfeeding friendly, whether it's a traditional dress, whether it's uh, an administrative role or something that impacts their their day-to-day life to make breastfeeding more of a natural option instead of an economic or, or social one. And so I heard you describing on the panel the dress. Can you describe here sort of what the differences were that you had to make in order for it to be more breastfeeding friendly? Sure. So the dresses as they're made now are about shin length. And the way that they're made today, uh, the first layer um, has a a cut um, on the chest that stops just above the breast, like in the middle of the sternum. And if you want to breastfeed and you're in traditional regalia, you would have to take off the belt that holds everything together and lift up both layers of dresses. And it can be very time consuming to do that um, multiple times a day. And traditionally during our ceremonies, we're in my community, we're wearing these dresses from about four in the morning to about 10 o'clock at night. And um, we're we have all of these different responsibilities. So it's not the most. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do. So what what we did was we um, redesigned just the top part of the dress. So we uh, inserted a zipper that goes all the way down to the groin. Um, we inserted flaps um, that could uncover the breasts. Um, we had another dress that had a flap that you could lift over the breast and another prototype where it had buttons um across the shoulder and under the underarm as a kind of flap down. So the person who's breastfeeding and wearing these dresses wouldn't have to take off all of their regalia. They would just have to undo something on the top to access their breasts. Okay, awesome. And um, 
Binta and Jen, what other kinds of innovative solutions did you find at the breastfeeding festival? Um, well, one of the things that we wanted to focus on was equity um, and really um, gearing the solutions around community led innovation. And so seeing communities who are already doing this work coming in and doing like developing things that maybe they haven't had time to think about um, was the most interesting. I think um, some of my favorites um, were the ones that when you <laughs> looked at them, you're like, how have we not already thought about this? So um, the infant ready um toolkit that's coming out of New Orleans that's going to help breastfeeding mothers be prepared during disaster is one of the things that really stuck out to me um, as something that you wouldn't really think about it unless you've been through an experience like that that shows you what you need. And those community members have been through Katrina. They understood what it meant to need to feed a child in a disaster. Um, and I think one of the other ones that I didn't think about was um, an invention from a group a visually impaired um, that were helping visually impaired folks. And like the idea that visually impaired folks have a hard time knowing how much milk they've pumped, how long their milk has been in the refrigerator. And so what are the techno technological advances we could do to help them be able to breastfeed better? And so if you're not in those communities, those are things you just don't think about. And I think that's what made this hackathon so special that we were intentional about making sure those people designed their own solutions. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea that um, you're taking sort of this idea, you know, the dominant culture, able-bodied solutions to everything, right? The, the way we drive our cars, the way we sleep in our beds, it's all designed from that perspective. And you're flipping that and, and coming up with other solutions. So, um, Binta, what else did you do or find at the at the festival? So part of the Breast Festival was to address the postpartum experience that women, parents encounter that can create barriers to providing breast milk to their children. And part of what really made this unique is that as part of that postpartum experience, it includes policy. There's social, political, economic factors that bar parents from providing the best nutrition that they want to provide to their children. And as we looked at the landscape, the lack of paid leave in the United States is a major factor. One out of every four women goes back to work within 10 days of delivering a child. So even if they want to provide breast milk, it really isn't an option. So as part of the um, make paid leave, they make family leave not suck policy summit, we brought together leaders, about 60 to 7 people from across the country, from a range of different sectors, policymakers, health practitioners, architects of health policy, of, of paid leave programs, and activists to basically do our own version of hacking family leave in the United States and to focus it, as Jen said, on equity. So we're not just aiming to have paid leave, we want equitable paid leave that is inclusive to families, regardless of diverse family structures, genders, um, economic roles, etc. And what did you come up with? Like, did you find a solution that <laughs> that you could all agree on? So uh, a hacking version of a policy summit is a bit different than maybe something that's more technical, but there were definitely things that came out of it. Some of them are harder to touch, but in terms of the relationships, in terms of the conversations that were had and the information sharing, we have a number, we're basically hopefully um, building momentum with more and more states and municipalities considering paid leave proposals, as well as workplaces. So this was an opportunity for actors and engage in that space to share best practices, but we're also some of the challenges, how they've overcome them. And also, as we're thinking about it, to be centering the voices of people who are leading in terms of LGBTQ, low wage workers, immigrant workers, women and parents of color, to be thinking about our, our efforts, including them and centering them and how we're advancing these efforts. OK, and um, Becky, what what was your role? I know you you're like the staff person or organizer or coordinating it. What what does it take to put on a breastfeeding festival and then a hackathon and the policy piece and, and all of these different pieces? Sure. Yes, I would say I was like the glue um, and master cat herder for the, <laughs> the festival. And because we were centering equity as the primary focus, it took um it was a different timeline than I've been used to with projects because to build trust and relationships and really understand um what different communities what kind of work they've already been doing how we can add uh our 
interdisciplinary collaborative lens to that work. Um, so it took a lot of meetings and conversations and uh, consulting with advisory board members about if our whole process was truly reflecting our goals of being equitable in terms of the messaging, the recruiting, getting the right media team on board, working with groups with people like Vanessa Simmons from Normalized Breastfeeding to create a gorgeous set of portraits of um, to people from all sorts of backgrounds breastfeeding so that those are displayed all over the, the, the event itself and working with folks like Elizabeth Bain, uh, who was here last night with her chocolate milk documentary series. She also came and, um, helped create a, a mini documentary about the event itself. So lots of conversations, lots of learning, um, and lots of helping all of us sync up on the same page about, where we're going and um, how to stay on track with our goals. What were like some of the biggest challenges and, and how did you overcome that? Like what, you know, like lesson learned, how, what would you suggest to someone else doing this? That's a good question. That, we're, that's the phase we're very much in right now of reflecting on how, uh, how this all came together and how to help others who want to do equity driven innovation work, um, what, what sorts of, um, steps that they can take. Um, so some lessons were that relationships really matter, uh, that that's part of the takeaway of all of this. Yes, there are some great ideas that are out there in the world growing and getting more funding. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we're working on a equitable, inclusive, postpartum health care landscape where the policies fit people that um, have all sort have different needs or low age workers where the des the designs the marketing of the designs represent people that they're trying to serve all of these things then we have to get there together and and work with with many different partners um, Catherine what was the role of MIT and and sort of the, the more um, institutional support? Sure. Yes. Um, so we didn't quite, um, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but there was a prior hackathon in 2014. And that came about when I was a student at MIT and I had uh, my daughter and um, found myself, you know, between classes, uh, pumping breast milk, basically on the bathroom floor at the MIT Media Lab. <laughs> um, and so one of the things, so the, the project really had its inception at the Media Lab, which is this space where, um, we pride ourselves at the Media Lab on inventing the future. And I had this moment on the bathroom floor where I was like, well, this is not the future. <laughs> like, And if, if this is the future, the, the future that my institution is inventing isn't including me, isn't including my body. Um, and so that's sort of where the project originated. Um, and what it really tried to do, and it stayed at MIT, so both the 2014 and the 2018 events were at MIT, um, is really try to take that um, institutional narrative about the future, um, take that narrative about how um, MIT sees itself as being like the best uh, sort of most innovative institution, most technologically advanced, and really leverage that and in a way, ask them to put the, their money where their mouth is and say, well, like, okay, we're about the future. Okay, so what about the future of breastfeeding? Um, and originally when we, <clears throat> when we first started the project in 2014, the, the director of the lab actually said to me, I thought it was a joke. Like, I gave you guys money, but I thought it was just like a joke. Um, and then... <laughs> Once the, the, all of the press attention came in, uh, and I think he kind of realized, actually, this is not a joke. I mean, we're taking a kind of funny approach. We are using humor as a way to get the message out there, but this is definitely not a joke, <laughs> right? Um, they, they got on board and they really invested in this, uh, second version of the hackathon and really became a, a true partner and have really, um, in a way, ad adapted and adopted this work into their narrative about the media lab. Like, oh, uh, now our lab can include futures for breastfeeding women. Like, that is the thing that they now are, are proud of um, and see themselves as doing. Whereas at first they were like, I don't know what this is, but here I'll give you a little a little cash for your food or whatever. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So I think that's that's um, I think something we're quite proud of, and we're really we really value the partnership with MIT. Okay, and for the group, um, what's next? Like, what what comes now? Um, 
So we're figuring that out. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what we know most is that we have to have more gatherings of the folks that were there. And um, we've had some informal and some formal opportunities for them to get back together. And the synergies that are there when these folks that are working on different things around the country get together and they start sharing what they're working on or sharing how they're raising money. Um it's an amazing thing to see. And so I think what we've realized more than anything is that as we figure out what this looks like, there won't be a hackathon next year, <laughs> but uh, there will likely be some ways for us to gather folks back together again in some way and give them some development around how you um, continue your work with the equity lens, but then also just have the ability for them to connect with each other. Um, and so we don't know exactly what that looks like, but that's the premise that we're going for. And where can people go to learn more about you and follow follow what you're up to? The hashtag breastfeeding innovation uh, through our Twitter handle BF Innovation, and we have a newsletter you can sign up for on the website Make the Breast Pump Not Suck. And the most lively place for conversation is the Facebook group Hack the Breast Pump Make the Breast Pump Not Suck. Okay, Rachel, Becky, Catherine, Binsa, and Jen, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for our show today. Remember, if you need support to live your well woman life, head over to wellwomanlife.com slash Facebook to join us. Our monthly live event, Well Woman Drinks, brings women together to share our successes and challenges as women, leaders, moms, aunts, sisters, and all the other roles we carry. If you'd like to attend a Well Woman Drinks near you, or if there isn't one in your city yet and you'd like to start one, email info at wellwomanlife.com. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and subscribe in iTunes and leave a review. This helps raise visibility, which is super helpful when it comes to producing the show every week. For feedback, comments, or just to let me know you were listening today, find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Well Woman Life. I'm Giovanna Rossi for The Well Woman Show. Until next time, have a super powerful week.